our culture, it seems, is one that is fixated with love. Perhaps we could even say it, it appears that our culture is infatuated with love. You think just for a minute. Let me suggest just very briefly a couple of things. You go into the supermarket and there's all those magazines and many of those magazines are aimed at the ladies. Women's magazines containing, not all of them but many of them, containing the latest gossip on the celebrities, the celebrities' newest love or the stories love. Script writers in blockbuster movies, know that deep-seated within uh, each of those people that sit in the cinema is this desire, this hunger, this yearning for writing. Well, script writers into the storylines of even action movies or even animated stories, children's stories movies for children. Even they have traces of romance in even those stories, not just a love story, but even action-packed movies, even children's stories. There's often love. And we all know that the vast majority of songs in our world seem to be dominated with the theme of love. Everyone's singing about love. And when we open our Bibles, we find love stories, don't we? love stories in the Bible such as the story of Ruth and Boaz and we could mention many others. But we also find when we open our Bibles a true love song. Maybe you've never thought of that. But we have in our Bibles a true love song and it's found in the book that we read from before. It contains what could be described as a series of dramatic love songs between Solomon and a Shulamite woman. It's the song of wooing. It's the song of wedding of a groom and his bride. It's possibly depicting their mutual period of betrothal. Now, we don't have that today. We have an engagement. It's a little bit like that. But, of course, it was a lot stronger. They were betrothed to one another. It was like they were husband and wife and yet they had not yet come together. They had not yet united in union in marriage. And it seems that that's possible. Any of this, it's possibly that's what this is in the book of Solomon, the Song of Solomon. But friends, beyond this historical setting, the Song of Solomon also abounds in metaphors and oriental imagery. For this love song pictures far more than just a, a man and, a, and his love for his people, his bride. And it also pictures the people of God's love for him they're groom. It's the mutual love of Christ for his people and if you like, it's, it's not just his love for them, it's also their love for him. Married or not, marriage is certainly clearly part of what this whole love song is about. And marriage, it is the closest of all human relationships as God has intended it to be. It's the greatest love relationship that there is available for humans, marriage. That's not saying there can't be other relationships. It's not saying we can't, there's not other relationships where there is love. But the greatest, the closest of loving relationships is between the husband and the wife and the wife and the husband. And this love relationship between a husband and a wife, it becomes an amazing picture of God and his people. And that figure occurs again and again in the Word of God. For instance, in the Old Testament, the prophet Hosea says, in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 9, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know relationship with me, the Lord. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 3.14, Return, O backsliding children. Why? For I am married to you. We're all familiar with Ephesians 5 in the New Testament. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ. The last book of the Bible also speaks about God's people as a bride. Come and says, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. John saw God's people coming down out of heaven in Revelation 21 and he says, adorned 
for her husband. This love relationship between a husband and his bride, it's a clear picture of the mutual love of Christ and his people. Now, prior to our brief detour into baptism and membership over the recent weeks, we began to love the heart of God. And in our first study, our focus of concern was God's amazing love for us. Those of you with us on that day may remember Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 where Paul says that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. We are to be growing in our experimental knowledge of Christ's amazing love. Not just his general love for all men, but his special love reserved for his people. And that prayer in Ephesians 3, that we Christians, with all the saints, he says, may be able to comprehend the surpassing love of Christ. Well, having briefly then considered several weeks ago something of God's love for us, we move now today to think of our love but not just a sterile sterile love acting in bland obedience such as the command both in the Old and New Testament. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and your strength. Not just a sterile love acting in bland obedience to such a kind of our love to God as it is presented in the oriental love relationship, the communion that we see in Solomon's song here this morning, this love song, that mutual love of Christ and his people. So yes, as we think of this, yes, if I am a Christian, that in a special way God loves me, truth, that I love him. That I am in a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. And that I can say that my beloved is mine and I am his not just facts of love, but a devotional love, our union and communion with Christ. So this morning we're considering our love for Christ. And the two things I want us to think about will be these. Firstly, the confidence of love. And then secondly, the com- You still have your Bibles there and Song of Solomon opened. Please, if not, turn back to Solom- Song of Solomon chapter 2 as we think about the confidence of love. And again, I want us to focus in on chapter 2 mainly, but in particular, verse 16 is that phrase I want us to think about over and over. I, and I am his. Turn over to chapter 6 and you will notice in verse 3 very similar words, though it's not exactly the same. Chapter 6 and verse 3 it says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. My beloved is mine and I am his. So here's the confidence of this marriage relationship, this loving union, this confidence. My beloved is mine and I am his, says the woman. This is the Shulamite woman. The woman loves her groom or at least the one she's betrothed to, the one that she will soon be united to, and yet she's already committed to him in this relationship of love. You see, to her, this woman, when she thinks about her beloved, when she thinks about her man, there is no one that comes. He is the best of all that may be available. He's the number one. And what does she say about him in chapter 5 and verse 10? Well, she goes on to brag, if you like, almost about her man in this oriental way of expressing herself. And to us, it's rather humorous that the beloved is white and ruddy. Chief, fair, the distinguished one among 10,000. So compare my man, compare my beloved with 10,000 others, then he distinguishes himself. He stands out, he's the fairest. Of 10,000, he's the chief of them all. And for the Christian, Jesus Christ is the chief among 10,000, is he not? 
Christ has no equal in our eyes. We can say about Jesus, my beloved, is why he is presentable in a manly way. He is chief among 10,000. This is the one in this passage. She loves above all others. Though she does have other relationships in her life, it comes out in this book, her brothers are mentioned in this song. She has brothers in her There are also fellow companions that are spoken about here, the daughters of Jerusalem. She does have other relationships, this lady. But it's her betrothed groom who is the chief love of her life. He is the one who is the sweetest to her. He is her sweetheart. Number one spot. And look what she says about him in verse 16. His mouth, this is in chapter 5, sorry, in verse 16. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. She's bragging to these others. If you had this one, you would have the best. But he's mine. My beloved is mine and I am here. This is a true picture. Even those words in chapter 5 and verse 16, it's a true picture of, 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 of a genuine Christian legitimately so we have family relationships we have friendships with others but for the true Christian our love for Christ is the deepest of all loves and if it's not then we are not a true Christian he is the one who is altogether lovely for us Jesus see he is our beloved he is our friend we have other friends but he's our closest friend he's our chief friend He's our number one friend. He is the friend, we can say, of this sinner. My beloved is mine and I am his. This of this love. Now, I want us to think as we open up the confidence of this love, firstly about the root of this confidence of love. Why is it that this woman loves this man, her beloved? Why? What's the root? What's the heart of it? What's the root of it? Why is it that, that you the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, John tells us, doesn't he? He makes the statement where many of us are familiar with it. We love him. It's a confident statement. We love him. Why do we love him? Well, John tells us, we love him because he first loved us. You see, here is the root of all true love for Christ. His love for me first. An awareness that God not only so loved the world, but as Paul says in Galatians 2, he loved me. He. If you look in chapter 2 of Son of Solomon, back in chapter 2 and verse 4, listen to what she says here. He brought me to the banqueting house. You see, the only reason that I am in a relationship with the Lord into his house Here is a Shulamite woman saying, he has brought me into his house. I haven't sort of been bold and pushed my way in. He brought me into his house. And that's the Christian, isn't it? I didn't find my way to Jesus. He hadn't brought me into this loving relationship. I would have never had come to him. I love him because he first loves me. What's the Shulamite woman's testimony here in verse 4? And his banner over me was love. What's written there? What's on that banner? She says, I want you to notice, she says to her friends, I want you to notice what's written over me. It's L-O-V-E. It's love. In this, as we look at it with Christian eyes, with New Testament eyes, if you like, L O V E. It's written on the banner and it's written in blood. You say, that's gross. No, it's wonderful. We sang before, oh, plan, oh, the grace that brought it down to man, oh, the mighty gulf that God did span. Where? At Calvary? where there was blood spilt 
out of love. Love written in His blood. His banner over me is His love that drew us to Him. It was His love that conquered our stubborn wills. It was His love that won us to Him. It was His love that united us to Him. And it is His love that holds us firmly in His hand. There are so many songs I wanted us to sing this morning because this theme is everywhere in our songbook. I've found a friend. Oh, such a friend. What's he like? He loved me before I knew him. He drew me with the cords of love and to him and round my heart still closely twine those ties which nothing can sever for I am his and he is mine forever and forever. My beloved is mine and I am his. For Christ is his love for me. And it's not just about the past. This is current. If you turn over to chapter 7 and into verse 10, you'll notice there in chapter 7 and verse 10, again, there's something of a similar expression. What she's saying this time, I am, and his desire is, is toward me. Isn't that wonderful? You see, my beloved's love is eternal. Christ's love toward his people has been since before time. He displays time by dying for them. And every day, as a Christian, I am assured of his love toward me. His desire is, not was, not will be, his desire is toward me. Now that is my because the more I get to know my own heart, the more that amazes me. Does it not, you Christian? Why would he have a desire toward me? Action toward me. Or well, knowing that her beloved's desire was toward her, deepened the Shulamite woman's love for him. I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. This is toward me only deepens my love for him. I am my beloved's, and I will therefore willingly give myself wholeheartedly to him. I will abandon all my stubborn self-seeking and I will give myself unreservedly to him. And I am his and his banner over me is love. We consider the confidence of this love. We think of the root of that love. Now let's think of the reality of this. How could of the beloved's love for her and her love for him. How can there be this confidence? Well, because there's a reality here we need to just think about when it comes to this. And the reality for her was she was chosen in that culture. She'd been given by her father to this man And no doubt, according to the Oriental custom, the bride's price had been paid for her. And it's surely evidence in this love song that he himself... And friends, these are the realities that undergird the confidence of her love. And it's the reality for the Christian's love for Christ as well. She says with confidence... In chapter 2, I am his. In chapter 6 and verse 3, in chapter 7 and verse 10, she boldly asserts, I am my beloved's. And as a Christian, we too can say, I am his. Just like this, chosen as his bride, she had been given by the Father to him. She had had that bride price paid for her and she had been won by her man. Her heart had been won over, as it were, to him by even 
her own man. She could say, I am his. We can say about Jesus for reason, I'm his by his sovereign choice. I'm his by his gracious gift. I am his by his blood purchase and I am his by his winsome power. You think about those four things. Just as the Father did the marital choosing in that who I have as a Christian been chosen by his sovereign choice to be part of Christ's bride. Ephesians 1.4 He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. I am Christ by sovereign choice. But I'm also his by gracious gift. Jesus used language speaking of God the Father giving his elect people to his Son. And they're in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 6 and verse 37, Jesus said, all that the Father gives me, all of them. He says there in chapter 6 and verse 39, all he has given me, I shall lose none of them. He says in chapter 10, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. He just said out of my hand, a one. He then uses the same phrase in chapter 17 about all that those the Father has given to him, he will give eternal life. I'm his by his sovereign choice. I'm his by his gracious gift but I am also his, I can say I am his purchase. That doesn't need any proving for you, does it? Ephesians chapter 5, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul says, You are not your own. Therefore glorify God in your body. You're not your own, he says. And so therefore, what do we say? I am his. I'm not my own. Because he has purchased me with his own blood. And then finally, by his winds and power, he came to me and, and conquered my stubborn will. And he, he came to me like a winsome lover. He won my heart in his winsome power. Psalm 110 says, Your people shall be willing in the day of your power. My beloved is mine. And I am his, we could surely add. I'm I'm his by profession. For I have joined with his people. I want all to know that I am his. We think about then this confidence of loyalty. Now, lastly, the reluctance. What about those genuine Christians, those people who really are saved, who are quite sensitive people? Perhaps that's you. And you hear all this, your confident declaration, and you say to yourself, well, I don't know that I can actually say my beloved is mine and I am his. You have a reluctance to declare your love to him with such confidence. Well, let me give a brief word to the reluctant. Let me ask you a question, simple question. Do you cling to Jesus Christ? Is Jesus your chief love? Is he your soul's only hope? Are you him alone for your salvation? Or are you looking to someone else the Pope, Buddha. Are you looking to yourself as your hope of salvation? To Jesus Christ. Many of us love the beach. You know when the tide goes out, you see all the rocks exposed there on the beach or the headland. Have you ever noticed the little shells, they're holding on tight. They cling to that rock, whether it's under the water, whether it's out of the water, or whether it's being splashed 
by water, whatever the condition, they're clinging to the rock. That's what saving faith does. It clings to no one else. It looks to nothing else, regardless of the conditions of what's happening around us. It's a simple question. Are you clinging to Jesus Christ? Well, then if you are, you have grounds for confidence. Love Him. You don't need to know everything about Christ. You don't need to know everything that He says in His Bible. You just need to cling to Him by faith and rest in Him as your only hope for soul. Just like that lady in the crowd that sing with Jesus, she but touched the hem of Christ's garment. She was restored. My friend, my sensitive friend, the fact that you are wrestling with these very things is evidence that you are his. Let's be aware of our enemy. He loves to inflame doubts in every Christian's heart. A young Christian or someone who's it's one of his tactics. How do we overcome that? We like the little shell on the rock. We keep clinging to Christ. We hold on to his promises. Is it to you? For Peter says, to you who believe, He is precious. And if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. It's one of his promises. Therefore you can say, my beloved is my am his. You can say with Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, whom having not seen, we love. The confidence of love. And now secondly, friends, as we think about this whole theme of our love for Christ this morning. Think with me of love. This lady, this Shulamite woman openly declares, my beloved is mine and I am his. And and elsewhere in, in this song she's saying, I am my beloved's. It's not just a passing physical attraction or infatuation. There is true commitment in real love. Oh, that we had more of that today, hey friends? In marriages, in our culture. For where there is true love, true commitment. When a woman marries a man, that commitment is shown in different ways. One of the ways it's shown it has been shown, and I think still ought to be shown, though it's a little out of fashion. If she relinquishes, she takes on his name. She wants to be called by his name because she is committed to him. She loves her man, and that will mean she loves to hear his voice to listen to what he has to say. She loves to be around him. She is keen to be in his company. She has a deep love for him and that love shows itself in her commitment to him and we see that with this woman in this love song. Our genuine love for Christ. We want to be known by his name. We want to keep his word. And we'll be king for his company. Let's think of those three things known by his name. Think of the woman here in the story. She, this woman, she's about to, it seems to be, married, if not already. And yet before a woman marries her sweetheart in, in her life, she is known by her own name. That's the name she was given at birth, naturally. But when she's married, she's given a new name. She takes on his name, name now in life. And before a sinner comes to Jesus Christ for salvation, we were just known by our own name. 
weren't we? Those of us who were saved. Well, we were just known by the name we were given at our birth. That's all we were known by. But what happened when we took on a new name? At the new birth, we were given a new name. Now, the book of Revelation talks about the Lamb's name written on our foreheads. Now, what's that? Is that J E S U R literally inscribed into our brows? Is that what Revelation means? Well, I personally don't think so. We'll be known by his name. That's the point. Like a bride, we take on the groom's name and we are called Christians. Christ ones. Followers of Christ who are commonly called Christians. Now the new bride is not ashamed to be known by her husband's name. People would now know that she is his. And when we are truly his, truly Christ, we're not ashamed to be known by his name. We want people to know that I am his. And that's why we've seen in recent weeks that a true disciple into his name. Why? Because I love him. I'm his. And I want to join, to be joined to his people so that all might know my beloved is mine and I am his. I am members of his body. He gave himself for me and I give myself to him. I love him and I therefore commit myself to follow him and to be known, to be associated not only with him but with his people. And therefore I joyfully join ranks and identify with others as the members of the church which bears one of the commitments of true love for Christ is we will unashamedly be known by his name. Secondly, keep his word. Any bride who truly loves her man to listen to his voice. Look at Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 8. You'll see the emphasis that comes through if you look further afield in the, in the book. But chapter 2 verse 8, see what it says. The voice, the voice of my beloved. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes. He's not even there yet. She's delighting in his voice. Behold, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. You see, her beloved is away from her. She longs to hear his voice again. In verse 10, she mentions once more his voice. My beloved spoke words to me. She's recalling the words that she heard her beloved say to her. And she says, in that verse, remember in chapter 5 and verse 16, where she calls her beloved her altogether lovely one. In that very verse she says, My beloved, his mouth. Now, how do you want to interpret that? She likes kissing him? Well, maybe. But perhaps it's, it's deeper than that. She, she loves to hear the words that come from his mouth. They are sweet for her to hear. His mouth is sweet. When we lo- Is it not true that we can recognise their voice calling out to us when we are in a crowd of other people calling out. We know our beloved's voice. And when we love someone, we are interested to hear what they have to do, what they say to us. What does Jesus say about his people when he speaks about them as sheep under his care as the good shepherd in John chapter 10? You know it, verse 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. That is, I am in a love relationship with their voice. They follow me, he says. My beloved is mine and I am his and I hear his voice and I know his voice and I love his voice. It is a sweet voice but I don't just leave it there. I follow his voice. Keep his word. And because I love him, I will go wherever he's calling me. 
And because I love him, I will obey whatever he commands me. And because I love him, I will follow wherever he leads me. True commitment, known by his name, keeps his word. Now finally, this is where we'll finish. Keen for his company. Those who truly love one another are certainly keen to be around one another. They're keen for each other's company. If they're ill, when they say they love that person. When a person, when, when a husband and a wife are, are apart, when there's a true deep love relationship between that man and his wife and for circumstances they have to be separated for a season of time, that brings them pain. And they long for the day again. They maybe, if it's days, they count down the days. Now, whatever the benefits are for modern communication, whatever benefits they may bring, and they do bring some benefits, the telephone and the email and so on, when a husband is away from the wife or vice versa. Friends, from my experience, as wonderful as that is, it is no substitute for personal communion. A loving wife is keen for the company of her husband and vice versa. Well, here in this passage, in chapter 2, this, this couple are temporarily separated. Again, I take time now in chapter 2 as we finish. Chapter 2, verse 8, The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. Her beloved is away from her. She longs for him to return. Here he is, up on the mountains. It's interesting, this chapter, this chapter. Look at the last part of verse 17. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of Betha. Betha literally means separation. She seems to be saying, Turn, come back to me, my old separation. Why? Because she is keen for her to have that communion again with him. She's keen for his company. We notice from verse 10, his words to her. Let's look a little closer now from what he says and what she recounts. These are his words. My love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land, the fig tree puts forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Right, and come away. And here is this invitation, as it were, by her beloved to renew their communion. According to those words, they've just been through the winter. But now it seems by that description that spring, with all of its renewed and fresh growth, the sun is shining. The flowers are blooming with all their sweet fragrance and bright colours and he even says the birds are singing. Now is the time to be renewed, he says. This is a new season. This is a time of fresh growth and vitality. We go through, don't we, a spiritual winter. The time when our walk with the Lord is dull. And we can identify with Cowper's words in his hymn, Where is the blessedness I knew? Where is that soul-refreshing view of Jesus and his word? Oh, what peaceful hours I once enjoyed! How sweet their memory still! But they have left an aching void. The world can never fill. You know, in those times, things are overcast for us. It's like we are in a thick winter cloud. We can't probably even really explain it. We can't articulate it very well, but we know that it's not what it should be. Now, we might still have our quiet time to have close communion with our beloved. It's like this. It's like there's a, a distance has come between us and the Lord we love. And when we really love him, we are not satisfied with that separation. And if you know, we're not satisfied with that separation because we're keen for his company. And 
in those times he comes to us and he gently says to us, rise up my loved one and come away with me again. A new season in our relationship has begun. It's springtime. Face of the sun is out again. Time for fresh growth and vitality. But look at verse 14. Again, he speaks to urge her, in, it seems, her doubts and fears. It says in verse 14, O my dove, rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Here he likens his woman, this lady, and yet she's distant. He likens her to a sweet but timid dove. And it's like it seems as he describes here, she's hiding away in the crevice of a rock like a dove. She's fearful. Like a dove, she's been easily from uncertainties. Perhaps she's hiding because of shame, because she's disobeyed God. She's sinned. What her beloved do? He calls to her to turn her face back toward him and have communion with him once. Christ loves to hear the voice of his loving disciple. He desires to look into our faces. Verse 14 says that. Let me see your face. Oh, let me hear your voice. You're speaking to his people. This is the man speaking to the woman now, not the woman speaking about the man's voice. Christ is saying, I love your voice. It is sweet when you pray and sing to me and worship me. Your face is lovely. Oh, our beloved is so gentle and tender in his dealings with us when we need to return to sweet communion again. Is your Lord calling you again, Christian friend, today? Calling you to renew your walk with Him? To come away from all the busyness and hassles of life and renew? Well, if He is, respond to His gentle and tender voice. What's He saying to you? Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away again and commune with me. Leave your fears, leave your doubts and look into my face afresh. Jesus comes to his people in the language of Revelation chapter 2. He stands at the door and he knocks and he comes to being distant from him. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and commune with him and he with me. My friend, do you love the Lord Jesus? You'll be keen for his company. You'll be looking to have regular communion with him. My beloved is mine and I am his and therefore I ever look for my beloved's company. If we truly love him and just going through the motions in private worship, if we truly love him, we will never go too long just going through the motions in corporate worship. We want to meet with our God. We want to have heart-to-heart fellowship with him, loving communion with the beloved. Please to use his word today, this unique, special part of the scriptures, to renew our love for our beloved that we may be able to say with freshness, yes, it is true, my beloved is mine and I am his and his banner over me is love. Yet there is probably some here this morning and you cannot say that you love the Lord. And we're fearful for you. We're fearful for you but for you because Paul said if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ 
let him or her be accursed. You see, not to love the Lord Jesus Christ is to invite his displeasure and wrath. Because not to love him is to spurn his love for you. Oh, my sinner friend, yield your stubborn heart to the Lord this day and submit to his loving rule over your life. Embrace him and you will. Because he loves like no one else. He's not just the chief of 10,000. He is the chief of everyone. And he loves like no one. May all of us here then be able today, my beloved Lord Jesus is mine, and I am his. His banner over me is love.